This episode of Midco Sports Magazine is presented by Shields and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Hello, welcome once again to Midco Sports Magazine. It's October, it's football season, and we've got three great stories this month with a focus on the gridiron. 99% of nine-man football in the United States is played in the Dakotas and Minnesota. We will show you why nine is enough on a small town Friday night. And how the last name Salem became the first name in coaching. Fathers and sons in a coaching family tree that spreads over generations and across the country. And we start with another father-son story. Two sons who have gone on to play college football. A father who inspired them to always keep going, always keep fighting, like he did, even when he had a really good excuse not to. Here is Carla Metz. Accomplishments are often accompanied with adversity, and it's our response to adversity that has the capability to inspire others. Sometimes it's people we don't know, and sometimes it's those right under our own roof. Bill Marlett has been the treasurer at Sanford since 1989, but when he was in high school, he was known for his athletic ability in wrestling, track, and football. Interestingly enough, I did not play football my seventh grade year because I had a problem with a heel. When I did start playing football, I just, I just absolutely loved it. He was a running back and linebacker for Redfield High School in South Dakota, and not only did he play on both sides of the ball, but he thrived. He helped lead the 1973 Pheasants to an undefeated season and was an All-State player his senior year, rushing over 1,500 yards, which caught the eyes of collegiate programs like South Dakota. And all of that came after losing his arm in a life-threatening accident. Then after my motorcycle accident, which was right at the end of my sophomore year, I was surrounded by a group of people, coaches and friends, who weren't going to let me do anything but participate. The newspapers wrote of his determination, but for Bill, it was a natural step forward. Quite honestly, I didn't think it was an option not to participate anyway. It would be that attitude and decision in 1973 that would manifest itself years later in his children, both on the field and in life, which is probably why he had not one, but two sons go on to play Division I football as linebackers. Tim Marlette played at South Dakota, and Dan Marlette is currently playing at North Dakota State. My grandma made like a scrapbook of, you know, throughout the years, and I actually didn't see that or, you know, let alone hear anything about him playing, you know, sports in high school with one arm um, until freshman year in high school. So I, he didn't talk about it much. Once I saw that, it was kind of like, wow, I, I don't have anything to cl complain about, and it's just motivation for me. You hear kind of that story about how oh, I had to walk to school uphill both ways and driving snow, but he had to do everything with, with one arm. And the fact that he did it and he did it well, I think, drives my brother and I to, to try and be as good as we can be. When I look back on it, um, it happened at the end of May and I was in the hospital at May in early June. And in July, I was playing baseball. It, it never struck me as something to talk about. There was always a learning curve in every sport. When I was a junior, our quarterback was an all-state quarterback, so he was very skilled. I was the pitch back in a veer offense. So when we were going to my right, he led me. When we were going to our left, he actually pitched it a little behind me. His response continues to inspire his son's athletic careers, but it's the connection and love for sports that has shaped their relationship. Bill and his wife, Jan, traveled to nearly every USD game until 2012 to support Tim, which was an easy school to root for since Bill shares the same alma mater. At that point especially, I, I knew that his heart was in it as much as an alumni, as a father, to, to go out there and watch me play. And so that was really cool. That's, that is something that we're going to have for, for the rest of our lives. Now that Dan plays for the Bison, they travel a little further north on the weekends and leave their red at home. Bill stays neutral during the NDSU-USD matchups, showing favor for both schools 
at least during tailgating. Like last year when they played up there in tailgating, I had my NDSU stuff on, but I had my USD hat on. Now I took it off when I went into the, the dome. For Bill, football is more than a game. He's drawn to athletics for the same reason he was even before his accident. Between teamwork and, and leadership, um, and then time management, especially in college, has is, is just been, in, I think, is invaluable. And I'm so proud of both of them, the way they handle it. The news articles written in the 70s emphasize Bill's balance and strength coming back from his accident physically. But it's the mental balance and strength that sports teaches that's most important to Bill and something his boys have adopted in their own lives off the gridiron. There are really no limits when it comes to what you can do. You just gotta, you know, keep at it. That at some point something's gonna go wrong. No matter how prepared you are and how good your team is, something's gonna go wrong. And, and working through that, coming together as a team and, and building through that adversity is one of the greatest lessons you'll ever learn at any level of sports. And joined now by Carla Metz. And uh, Carla, we saw Dad in the story with the coyote hat on and the bison jersey. He's got to play it both ways, right? But what about what about the boys? Do they still go head to head quite a bit? You know, they've been supportive of each other really throughout both of their careers. But Tim did tell us during the USD NDSU game he's going to be dressed in red from head to toe. So he's supportive of Dan, but his loyalties to USD. Uh, all right, thanks a lot, Carla Metz. Up next, from Noosier to Joe to Tim and Brad and Brent and Wade, how one South Dakota family has made its mark across the country coaching college football. Midco Sports Magazine on Midco Sports Network is presented by Shields and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Welcome back. There is a coaching family from South Dakota that has left a trail from Augustana University to the University of Minnesota to the University of South Dakota and now Pittsburgh and Michigan State. And for the Salem's, coaching hasn't always been just about winning. It's been more than that. Here is Jay Elson. The only thing we ask of you as a coaching staff is that you go out and play with every dang bit of enthusiasm you got. Play it like it's the last play you're ever going to play. Because at 4 o'clock, we come off the field, let's come off with a win. It's a profession that, that that just kind of you get tied into. You're five yards on that side of them, right? When the ball goes over there, you're on the left side, you're on the left side. You know, I don't know if there's ever a true point that, uh, you know, I decided to get into coaching. You know, I just know that uh, the coaching uh, world was uh, an everyday uh, part of my life from uh, a youngster, uh, you know, all the way today. I like that you just sort of trust your guy. You need to go to him after this and go, listen, I'm, you're the only guy I'm looking at. And if you line up there, I will throw you a bench run. With my dad Joe coaching, you know, and being a head coach for 22 years, you sort of grow up in it, you know. And, and he coached through, you know, when my twin brother and I were till eighth grade. So that's sort of all, all you knew, and you sort of always thought, you know, it's something you aspired to do. Every family has a tree. Coaches have two. In this small Sioux Falls park stands a deeply rooted symbol of one family's long-lasting passion and football legacy. This is the Salem family coaching tree. Well, I was, uh, I guess, typically like my sons. Uh, I, my dad being the coach at Cathedral High School. When I was real small, I used to go to practice out across from the Terrace Park pool area. And then uh, we'd go to games and be on the sideline. And so because of that, you get involved in it. Following a standout prep career at Cathedral High School, Joe spent one season at Iowa State. He transferred to Minnesota in 1958. I was one of 12 quarterbacks. Three years later, I was, I was the only one of the 12 left. Uh, I, was, I, you know, I just kind of hung around. Joe's playing days closed on a high note, with the Gophers claiming a share of the 1960 Big Ten title, the national championship, and the program's first ever trip to the Rose Bowl. From there, he went straight into coaching. He spent the next five years as an assistant at Minnesota before an opportunity opened up closer to home. I remember coming home at Christmas and some guy said, you know, I think the University of South Dakota 
head coaching job's going to open up, would you be interested? And I said, ah, no way. And, and that was it. Well, in March, it opened up. And so I ended up, they called, and I ended up doing an interview and ended up getting the job. But I went there as a 27-year-old head coach. I was one of the youngest ever in the history of college football to start that young. And we ended up, uh, in, in our third year, went 9-1 and one and really had a good football team. And then we fell down a little bit, but we got back finally in 72, 73, uh, and four. We won three straight uh, uh, North Central Conference championships. Not only did South Dakota mark the beginning of Joe's successful career, it was also where the seeds for the next generation of Salem coaches were sowed. I think it started with the oldest, Tim. He started when he was like seven. He would come over to the office. It was, it was a bike ride away in that town. And he'd sit through every quarterback meeting, all during preseason ball. He'd go to every practice. He stayed there from start to finish. And, uh, and he was just there all the time. It, w it was just an everyday part of my life, uh, you know, to show up and you know, see the coyotes in action. And I think uh, as, as you do something as special as that and, and watch uh, you know, the unique part of football uh, move along, uh, you know, that was an exciting part growing up uh, those days in Vermilion. Tim's boyhood interest morphed into a career that has already spanned more than three decades and included stops in the Pac-12, Big Ten, and currently the ACC. The second one, uh, Wade was was interested in it, but it was more he became more more interested in basketball. And then Brad and Brent came along, and of course uh, we were at Northern Arizona at the time. And and then we when we moved to Minneapolis. They went to games. They were ball boys and they were 10 out of Big Ten games. Brent started down the coaching path in 1992 at Northern Arizona. He worked with Tim at Purdue in 94 and alongside Brad at South Dakota from 99 to 2001. He and his brothers learned together what all coaches have to accept. Initially you go in knowing. You know that's the one thing that I think you're pretty educated being the son of a coach that you know the track that you go through to you know go through coaching is you start very low. Like most, Brad started out as a graduate assistant, though his climb to the top was accelerated. In December of 2004, just four jobs and 10 years into his career, Brad got a shot as a head coach, taking over an Augustana program that had averaged four wins over the previous 12 seasons. Go out and do it together. But free it up and have no fear of failure. You know, I really wanted to be there for 30 years. My brother had bounced around Division One. I, I saw what that was about, and he had been jumping around to a couple different schools. And my father had actually retired from business and suckered him into being the quarterback coach. You know, really through my the entirety at Augie, and so he thought, what a good place and a place you really wanted to build um, and become a national contender. After leading the Vikings to three winning seasons in five years, it looked like that's exactly where he was headed. But in February of 2010, Brad got an unexpected phone call from a guy he'd worked with at Michigan State. His name was Mark D'Antonio, and he was now the Spartans head coach. The first thing he said is he said, Brad, I'd wanna screw your life up, but would you be interested in a running back position here at Michigan State? And I'm just kinda like, wow, you know, I didn't know what to say. And he goes, well, think about it, talk to your dad, talk to your wife. Kinda went there in the interview that next day with you know, I, I have a job, I don't need one. And so it was more to just go explore and meet the staff. And by the end of the day, he offers you a position there, and basically at dinner. He says, what do you think? And I kind of said, I'm in. I had to come back here and put the pieces together here. And then, uh, but, it, but it's been really just kind of a, you know, an awesome ride. The ride has included promotions to recruiting coordinator and now quarterbacks coach. But the best part has been the team's recent trip to one of the Salem's sacred places. Maybe the hallowed ground of our family is sort of the Rose Bowl. You know, with my father was able to play in it, you know, with Minnesota in 1960, and then um, my other brother was um, coaching at Arizona State when they went, and then for us to be able to go in 2014 was, you just sort of walk out there and you're like, wow, this is the Rose Bowl, and it was, the day itself was 80 sunny, no wind, no clouds, and obviously wind that helps, and so that was really a neat experience. For the Salem's, coaching is more than a profession. It's a bond rooted in the 1930s, nurtured in the 80s, and one that's still thriving today. Because of them, I've been still, I'm still involved today with it. I'll watch film, I'll watch the game on Saturday on television, and, and 
question if I, if I have a question. I know talking to him on Saturdays and meeting our following our game, there's nothing greater than a conversation that he has about uh, you know some particular play on third down and what were you thinking on that call or you know why did you do that? I mean, you know, his mind is still working from a football you know coaching side. Well, it's not a game. I mean, when you get down to it, it's really not a game. I mean, it's winning and losing. You know, as a coach, you didn't want to lose. But, I mean, that was the worst thing that you could could handle. And and then when you watch your sons, you don't want to see them lose either. And when they do, it hurts. But when they win, you feel great. It's not a game. It's, you know, it's a go get them. It's life or death. That's what makes the game so good. And joined now by Jay Elson. All right, you, Tim currently still at Pittsburgh. Still got Brad currently in Michigan State. What about Brent and what about Wade? What are they up to? Well, Brent is still in private business, but says you can never completely rule out a, a return to coaching. Says maybe one day he'll come back, help his son coach, similar to what Joe did with Brad at Augustana. As far as Wade's concerned, we heard in the piece that he took more of an interest in basketball, never really pursued the football side of things, but he is coaching. The difference is he's coaching coaches, has a company called Character Counts that helps coaches at the high school and college level build character within their programs. All right. Is there another, a next generation maybe of Salem's coming up? Yeah, there is. And uh, Tim's son, Landon, is currently on the staff at Pittsburgh. Uh, he's more interested in pursuing the recruiting and scouting uh, side of things. And sounds like he'll be very good at that if, if and when he takes off in that career. And then uh, Brent has a son, Luke, that's currently playing quarterback at St. Thomas up in the Twin Cities. Says he wants to pursue coaching as well, helping out GAing with one of his uncles after graduation. All right. Thanks a lot. Jay Elson. When we come back, it's a brand of high school football played almost exclusively in our part of the United States. How small towns have kept the game alive in a large part of the Dakotas and Minnesota. Midco Sports Magazine on Midco Sports Network is presented by Shields and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Welcome back. Football is an 11 player sport, right? Well, not necessarily in our part of the country where nine man football is alive and well. Here is Jason Andera. Friday nights in the fall. Across the country, you'll find similar scenes. Players, one, two, three, five. fans, and coaches all focused on one thing, high school football. Most teams will field 11, eight, or possibly six players. But in the small towns of the Dakotas and Minnesota, you'll find a brand of football unlike anywhere else. Nine-man football. Of the 265 high schools in the United States that play nine-man football, all but five are located in the tri-state area of Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota. But it hasn't always been that way. When they started football in, in 1900, um, it was all 11 men. There wasn't anything else. There was 11 men only. South Dakota soon added six men in the 30s, changed to eight men in the 60s, then in the early 70s... Then the nine men. The nine men came around. Four less players on the field, but the same amount of heart, grit, and determination. It's not a, it's not a slow man's game. <laughs> if you got somebody that can run a little bit and on a 100-yard on field, uh, it makes a whole ton of difference because you gotta, you got to defend sideline to sideline. It's more like basketball where it's on you. You can't hide out there. you got to be running all the time because, like I said, you got a bigger field. you got to be doing a lot of running. There's the same amount of eligible receivers. You just have less people to guard them. No matter the strategy, there's going to be talent on the field. Look no further than perhaps the most decorated nine-man player in history, a star at Stickney Mount Vernon. Chad Greenway. Chad Greenway. Chad Greenway. I didn't really realize that we were different, you know, until you get to get older, then you realize there's an 11-man ball in the state, and then you kind of start watching the NFL, and you start counting the numbers, and you're like, okay, we're different. But then, it, you know, it doesn't really resonate to you because that's just what we did. You know, I started getting recruiting and realized that the people had a problem, some kind of a problem with, like, believing that a nine-man player could be legitimately good enough to be able to compete at, at a high level, and, and that was something I had to overcome, and a lot of nine-man players have to overcome. Chad's now an 11-year veteran linebacker with the Minnesota Vikings. But considering where he was 15 years ago, NFL stardom seemed like a long shot. And honestly, the first time I ever played 11-man football was when I walked on the field at Iowa. I never played an all-star game, I never played anything that was 11-man. So the first time I did it was the first team drill I did as a freshman at the University of Iowa. Nine-man has become a celebration of not just players and fans, 
but communities themselves. In the early decades, spectators would pull their cars right up to the sidelines of a shortened 80-yard field. While the crowd and field have become a little more spread out over the years, the spotlight on these nine-man schools remains brighter than ever. The smaller town you're in, the more community support, uh, support there is and the more it means to those parents. It's really important, I think, to the small town that they have, have that event on Friday night to go to. For us kids, that was a big deal, to be out there in the Friday night lights and, and play against uh, some great competition. Um, you know, we had a great robber against like Emory Ethan. Uh, it was a great football program. Plankton and White Lake were together at the time. They had a great program. It was just a ton of fun. I mean, you had to think back to some of those Friday nights and, and some of the memories that you'll, you'll just never forget. In smaller communities, finding athletes to withstand an entire season is still a challenge where population is constantly fluctuating. Lena's year, we were down to 17, 18. I remember a, a one particular game where we were down to 16 kids and we had no one to run the plays into the quarterback, so we were down to hand signals and holding up number signs and we had all the plays on wristbands for our quarterback. If you're a single town right now and you got, you got a team, every, every boy's playing. I think growing up in a small town is one of the things you realize is you don't you don't just play one sport, you're not just specializing in football. I mean, we played everything, whatever was next, we dropped the, the football and went to basketball, we dropped the basketball into track and on to baseball. I think the biggest challenge is uh, the numbers game. Uh, the, the, right now I was looking at the, the 9B schools this year and I think seven or eight of the 9B schools this year, the smallest classification, were once played 11 men. And yet, with all the challenges to both maintain a team and gain respect, it's the opportunity that makes the difference. Talent is talent, and with more football coverage than ever before, colleges will find those quote unquote hidden gems. In fact, the colleges like to like those man, nine man kids because they work hard, because they've had to work hard. Um, they've come up from nothing to being all stars. You can be from Harding County. If you're good, they're gonna find it. They're gonna find you. But guess what? That's always been that way. Sometimes you kind of isolate yourself, being from a small community, thinking that, that this isn't possible. You know, yes, I want that as my dream to play in the NFL or to play at Big Ten football, but um, sometimes we isolate ourselves because we're a little bit scared of going out there. I know I was. You know, scared to throw yourself out there and say, hey, I'm good enough to go play at Iowa. It was, I was scared as hell to go do it, but the reality is, is I went there and I could prove myself to myself and to everybody in the state of South Dakota that I was good enough. And I think that's important for kids to, to know coming from small towns. Friday Night Lights will forever remain a part of American culture. Whether you're the top recruit from Texas or a nine-man player trying to make a name for himself, talent will always rise to the top. Nine-man football isn't a step down from the usual 11-man. It's a step up for those who would have never had a chance otherwise. One, two, three, dive in! Some of my favorite memories are high school football. I think if you asked any NFL player, they'd probably say that. If you enjoy football, uh, you can enjoy nine man as every bit as much as you can the 11 man. In fact, you ask all the schools that are playing nine man right now, they will tell you that we like our product better. <laughs> all right, Jandy, there's a lot of states that play eight man football. Iowa and Nebraska play eight man. Why nine man in our part of the world? Really, it depends who you ask. There's a lot of different answers. The most popular answer is, it's the most like 11-man football. You just have to take the tackles out on offense. Plus, it's nice to be able to play teams across the border, other teams that can play nine-man as well. All right. And there is such a thing as a nine-man team playing an 11-man team. It can't happen, right? It can happen. Kindred and Richland play every year in North Dakota. And I've seen Britton Heckle schedule some teams when they go down to nine-man football against 11-man. And whoever's on offense gets to play their brand of football. It's interesting. All right. Thanks a lot. Jason and Derek. Thanks for watching. You can find all of the episodes of Midco Sports Magazine on YouTube. This has been Midco Sports Magazine, presented by Shields and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine.